Hi, this is the previous lecture for lecture 10. Um, in the previous lecture, lecture 9, we have discussed about the solution of two-dimensional Laplace equation. We will extend our discussion to the two-dimensional Poisson equation at the beginning of our lecture. The main contents of lecture 10 is the calculation of a three-dimensional infinite potential well problem. Okay, let's go. Mm, yes, when we write down the Poisson equation in two-dimensional space, then now we have this coefficient in front of the first derivative with respect to x and y. Mm, inner lesion, in a silicon lesion or oxide lesion, so this is a constant. However, at the boundary between, for example, silicon and silicon dioxide, now we have discontinuity of this epsilon. So that should be considered in our Poisson equation explicitly. But I hope that we have already covered it in several times. So now you can think about it quite easily. Mm. Okay. And boundary conditions are the same. There is no changes in the boundary condition. So you can think about directly boundary condition and Neumann boundary condition for your two different boundaries. So contact boundaries and non-contact boundaries. Okay. The only thing I wanted to ask you with a question is initial gas at equilibrium. Why am I adding a specifier at equilibrium? So for other voltages, like uh, for example, if we go to 0.1 volt, 0.2 volt, or other bias voltages, then we can use the previous solution, for example, at 0.1 volt as an initial gas for 0.2 volt and the composite solution at 0.2 volt is used for the initial gas at 0.3 volt. So everything is quite uh, easy and natural but point is now we have to provide the solution at Vg equal to 0 volt. So this is the starting point of our all bias lamping procedure. However, um, there is no other bias to be referred. So we have to generate the initial gas at equilibrium from scratch. So how can we set the initial gas for this special bias condition? So we have a rule of sum. There is no um, strict uh, regulation for setting the values, but I think that this is quite common and it is working properly. We have to distinguish semiconductor regions and insulator regions. So for insulator region, just leave it zero. So no care is required. But in the case of a semiconductor regions, please apply the local charge balance. You have seen it before. So this is corresponding to your N density, electron density, and this is corresponding to your hole density. So it simply means that the sum of positively charged doping density N plus and positively charged hole minus negatively charged electron density should vanish. At a certain position, we have a local charge balance relation. And as you can easily understand, it was the homework number seven. If you have done it properly, then you can take the code for the ingrained of your homework today. Okay. Then, now we have homework 10. Oh, homework 10 is 
um, announced a little early. So next Monday, you have more or less five days to uh, perform this homework number 10. And the problem is simple. Calculate the electrostatic potential at various um, gate voltages. For example, 0 volt and 1.1 volt. Of course, in order to achieve the electrostatic potential at Vg equal to 1.1 volt, you have to introduce many intermediate steps from 0 volt to 1.1 volt. Otherwise, you cannot directly jump into 1.1 volt. Okay? The problem or <coughs> the model system is given here. We have um, 30 nanometer long structure and one third of it is assigned to source region with highly doped n-type region. So this is n-type and another um, another third is assigned to the drain region. Also, we have a highly doped n-type region, and yes, it is 10 nanometer long. We have a channel region, so it is again 10 nanometer long, and this is intrinsic. We have no doping in it. So we have just the intrinsic channel. And please, for gates located here, please just to use the usual value of a work function we have used in the previous problems. And here and there, we have source contact and drain contact. And for these two boundaries, please fix your electrostatic potential at these nodes and these nodes. And the value of uh, at these nodes are given by this local charge balance relation. That is quite understandable. Then the vertical structure is exactly same as before so here the particle structure is given as 5 nanometer thick silicon surrounded by 1 nanometer thick oxide and 1 nanometer thick oxide mm -hmm. so I give you five days for this homework and I think that that can be a milestone for your homework problem. So if you cannot solve this problem, then maybe it will be really difficult for you to follow this lecture. So um, please concentrate on homework number 10. Um, I think that you have already made Nonlinear Poisson solver solver for 1D. You did it, and in the last lecture, you have done the Laplace equation for 2D. So, by combining these two experience, then you can get the working code for the uh, double gate structure shown here. So please do so. Now we are going to the main contents of our today's lecture. Today's lecture wanted to talk about three-dimensional infinite potential well problem. Mm, in this case, we will assume a thin and wide box. So here we have a three-dimensional structure. Um, so this is x-direction and this is y-direction 
and this is z direction so although we have a three dimensional structure um, the only direction where a strong confinement effect occurs is assumed to be the z direction we have a very thin layer along z direction and instead of that the dimension along x direction or y direction are quite long okay so in this case what will happen although we are considering a three-dimensional box however actually it will be just like a one-dimensional box we will have strong confinement only along this g directional confinement we will have free electron along x direction and y direction so um, we can have the analytic solution for this three-dimensional infinite potential well problem hamiltonian is of course given by this simple form and here we have mass here and here and here we will adopt so-called effective mass approximation so that's the reason why our Hamiltonian operator is so simple in this case we have introduced directional mass so x directional mass and y directional mass and g directional mass however we neglect some components like m sub x y or m sub y z or m sub x z so they are assumed to be zero in our example then maybe you can ask me a question then in the computational microelectronics everybody just neglect this uh, op diagonal component of uh, mass tensor then i want to say no they are not neglected in general so only for educational purpose i will just assume this diagonal um, mass tensor actually inverse mass tensor so anyway now we have this simple form then fortunately they can be decomposed into three small problems when we decompose our wave function into three pieces which depends on only x and only y and only z it becomes successful so we can find that there is three different components making the whole solution so this is depending on x only and this is depending on y only and this one is depending on z only so by multiplying these three small wave functions we can get the entire one we have quantum numbers l m n um, which is corresponding to x-directional, y-directional, g-directional wave function. Yes. You can easily get the solution. And of course, eigenenergy is given as sum of directional energies. So here we have mm -hmm, x-directional contribution, y-directional contribution, and z-directional contribution one thing we have to keep in mind is here we have x directional mass and y directional mass and g directional mass so let's assume a different uh, um, situation right now we are assuming that lg is so small but lx and ly are quite larger than lg so in this case in this case of lg is much 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 smaller than lx 
and L Y. Then what will happen to these eigen energies? So since L G is so small compared with the other terms, so contribution from L X and L Y can be negligible than that from L Z. So that will be the dominating factor to make a differences in eigen energy. However, think about another case happen to be Lx, Ly, Lz are the same. Then what will happen? This one, this one, this one does not make a big difference in the in evaluating the eigen energy. So in this case, mass can play quite a big role, important role in this case. For example, in the case of silicon, so among three MXX, MYY, MGZ, one of them can be quite large. I mean that around 0.9 of electron last mass and two others are quite small like just a point around 0.2 of m naught electron last mass. So let's say that if this one becomes 0 0.01 m naught and all other are 0.19 and 0.19, then what will happen? So in this case, the change in your quantum number n does not make big difference so it is not generating much differences in your eigen energy but when you change your l or your m in this case you can get quite large differences in your um, eigen energy okay so please keep in mind that um there are two different factors to affecting eigen energies. One is directional size Lx, Ly, Lz. And the other is directional mass Mxx, Myy, and Mzz. Their interplay determines the eigen energy of our interested system. Okay, I think that you can get the eigen energy quite easily because we have a given band structure and L, M, N can be set by ourselves. So once you set triplet of a quantum numbers, then you can get eigen energy quite easily. So next task, task is to calculate the number of electrons occupying this um, this three-dimensional infinite potential well. So for that purpose, we will just to use Fermi-Dirac distribution. So Fermi-Dirac distribution is applied with an assumption of zero Fermi level. So Fermi level is just zero electron volt. In this case, um, we can easily understand from Dirac distribution is given by this form. Actually, we have to have minus the formula level, but that is assumed to be zero in our example. So we can just neglect it. Then what will happen? For given triplet of quantum numbers L and N, you can immediately calculate E sub L m n and by using this number you can calculate the occupancy of your state so by summing them all for all l m n triplet then you can count the entire number of electrons inside this infinite potential well so total number is simply given by this one the number of electrons at the 
certain state is given by 2 times Fermi Dirac distribution. Here, number 2 is given by the spin degeneracy. So in this course, we will not talk much about spin. So spin is always treated as degenerate quantities. And since there are many states according to L, M, N, so we will just have a triple loop for L, M, N, and each triplet is corresponding to each distinct energy state. So for each distinct energy state, we just calculate the contribution to the total number. By summing them all, we can get the total number. So here we have a MATLAB example. For example, uh, G-directional confinement direction is just uh, a physical length of 5 nanometer. This is uh, quite uh, short. However, along X-direction or Y-direction, we have 100 nanometer. Oh, this is uh, already 20 times larger than that. So how about our transistors? In practical sense, our LG of 5 nanometer is quite reasonable in modern transistors. Mm, LX and LY, which are assumed uh, as 100 nanometer, these values are somewhat large. You know that for our quite scaled devices, LX can be just uh, around 15 nanometer or even smaller and ly can be also quite small however it is still, still true that lx and ly is larger than lz so for a while we can assume this kind of a clear separation between lz and lx ly okay And as I told you before, in silicon, the effective mass, directional effective mass can be deferred. Um, so in this example, we have assumed that g-directional component has a heavy mass. Also, x-directional and y-directional, we have light values. And let's solve it. So these this part is just defining some constant, universal constant, um, except for this temperature assignment, yes, 300 Kelvin. And now these lines are corresponding to structures and system specific one. So LX and LY are set to be just 100 nanometer um, and LZ is 5 nanometer. And we have a different masses for x, y, and g direction. Then let me just loop triple loops for L, M, N. And this loop starts from 1, which is the ground state for each direction, and up to, in principle, infinity. Mm. However, you know that for or uh, infinitely large values of L, M, N, the energy will be quite large and Fermi Dirac distribution for this quite large number will not contribute to, to the total number. So we can safely restrict ourselves to certain finite number but large number. So in this case, I just said 50, but I'm certainly sure that we can use much smaller numbers without degrading our numerical solution. Anyway, using these numbers, you can calculate the energy then by using this energy, you can calculate the total number. Initially, the total number is cleared, so it starts from number 0 and we just add contribution of 
ichi um, eigen mode so that will give you certain number please note that when you make this code then as a result you will have total number then what is the unit of this total number the variable called total number it is just unitless quantity it just reveals that how many electrons are there there means that very thin and wide box so if you are curious about the volume density of your electrons then you have to divide your total number by your lx ly and lg the total volume of your thin and wide box okay i think that this uh, example is quite uh, straightforward so i will not give any further homework for this example please do your exercise and for this week please concentrate on the homework number 10 that is the real problem and it is an important milestone for our entire semester so please concentrate on homework number 10 thank you and see you Wednesday bye